the mountain of the Lord and to the house of the God. Shabbat shalom, shalom everyone. Here we are again, seven days later, ready to hear the word of the Lord. That's what life is all about. Knowing the heart and the mind of Hashem. So we can walk in His ways and honor Him and revere Him. It's His world. It's not ours. <laughs> Who do we think we are? <laughs> so, um, welcome subscribers. We have a, a large group of subscribers and we consider them being a part of Beit Torah. They listen, they watch. Last week's um, message, we had over 100 views, which is, for us, that's, that's a lot of views. <laughs> We're certainly not Joe Rogan, <laughs> and we don't care to be either, but we're just thankful that there are those subscribers and people that come across us on YouTube that are moved to listen, and we hope you're blessed and receive some food for your spirit and your soul, and uh, it's a blessing to you. At this time, I want to ask Varzak and uh, Eric Gomer to come up and share uh, his, what, what Hashem's given him for us to understand the purpose in this Parsha in the Prophets. The Prophets are important. They weren't real popular, but they were important. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> so, good to see you. All right. So uh, we are finishing up Vaikra Leviticus, uh, and this is the last Torah portion from that book, Bohukatai, uh, which basically means, in English, uh, by my regulations. Uh, and we see in this last portion for Leviticus, it starts out, if you live by my regulations, observe my commandments and obey them, then I will provide the rain you need and so on, um, and then he goes on to say, but if you will not listen to me and obey these commandments, so we get this uh, dichotomy of the cursings and the blessings, uh, and this will be a theme that will carry out throughout the rest of the Torah, um, specifically in Deuteronomy. Uh, Deuter Deuteronomy, uh, in English means the second giving of the law because if we remember the 12 spies go out and they sort of lose their faith other than Caleb uh, and Joshua and so that generation is basically spends its life out in the desert uh, you can take the people out of Egypt but sometimes you can't take the Egypt out of the people and so that's kind of where we are, and uh, in this particular portion we'll be reading from Jeremiah uh, 16, 19 through 17, 14. Uh, and just for a little bit of context, because reading this out of context uh, could be a little bit misleading, but if you remember in the beginning of chapter 16, uh, it says, this word of Adonai came to me, you're not to marry your sons or daughters, for this is what Adonai says concerning sons and daughters. So, really, uh, this is a harsh, uh, a harsh portion, right? Jeremiah uh, lives during the time of the Babylonian exile, and we're we're coming up to that historically. And so, northern Israel has already been assimilated and destroyed by the Assyrians. And now we have Judah in the south, in the southern kingdom. And they are essentially not keeping God's regulations. Um, and so that's sort of where the ties are for this portion of the prophets and this portion of the Torah itself. Uh, 
uh, God warns them in Leviticus what will happen uh, if they do not keep the commandments, and we're pretty much in the midst of that right now. Um, they are about to be exiled to Babylon, and Jeremiah the prophet. Uh, you know, it's interesting, Solomon and I went to see Daniel down at the Sight and Sound, and, you know, they, they brought, in the midst of Daniel, they brought in Ezekiel and Jeremiah as well because they were contemporaries, which I thought was good because it's, it's good for people to understand that these prophets overlapped. Um, but man, they portrayed both uh, Ezekiel and Jeremiah as these well-respected prophets and big, strong, you know, Hebrew men. But the reality was that if that were the case, probably more and more of Israel would have listened to them. Uh, they were probably seen as crazy people, right? <laughs> as these outcasts who are saying all these things, you know, because they're telling, they're telling Israel, you need to repent, right? You, you, you're, you're, you're not following God's commandments, and these curses are going to come, not just to you, but to all of Israel. And as Jesus, as Yeshua said, you know, told the, the, the um, Pharisees, you killed all your prophets, right? And we get... You know, John the Baptist, he was a prophet, cra crazy, you know, act, tr treated as a crazy man, eating bugs, living out in the woods, no one, or, or at least the elite of Israel did not respect him, and then ultimately we have, you know, Yeshua, the Messiah, and the same thing goes there, right? So, we see this pattern throughout uh, Scripture where sometimes we don't recognize what's right in front of us, right? We don't know what we're looking for. And certainly these prophets were no different. Uh, they were all treated poorly by Israel, and they were probably all seen as uh, crazy people saying things they don't want to say. I mean, <clears throat> so in, uh, in this Haftorah, uh, uh, we read this week from Jeremiah, which we already discussed, uh, chapter 16. And it highlights the consequences of disobedience uh, to God's commandments. Uh, focusing on the exile of the people of Israel due to their transgressions. Uh, so these verses echo the themes illustrated in Bahukatai, in the Torah portion, underscoring the importance of heeding uh, divine laws to avoid suffering and encouraging repentance. And again, this is echoed throughout, and we see this even in the New Testament. And so what I'll try to do is, as usual, I'll try to use the prophets to sort of bridge the Torah with the, uh, the Gospels and the teachings of Yeshua. Uh, and so... One of the interesting things I'll point out just before I read uh, through Jeremiah here is that uh, this seven times over thing, this, this initial sort of curse. Uh, so in Levit Levit Leviticus 26, 18, it says, If these things don't make you listen to me, then I will discipline you seven times over for your sins. It goes on in 26 to say, If in spite of all this you refuse my correction and still go against me, then I too will go against you, and I, yes, I will strike you seven times over for your sins. And then it continues on and says, And if for all of this you still are not listening to me, but go against me, then I will go against you furiously, and I will, and I also will chastise you seven times more for your sins. So we see this language used. Um, throughout here, we know that the Babylonian exile is 70 years, so Jeremiah prophesizes that it'll be 70 years, they'll be exiled out, and the land will get its Shabbats, but we know in Daniel that Daniel has a prophecy, 70 years passes, he's in Babylon, and he prays to God, and he says, God, 70 years is coming up, and you know, are, you, are, are we going to be returned to our land? And obviously an angel shows up and says, I got some bad news. I got good news. You know, God hasn't forgotten about you, but the bad news is it's actually going to be 70 times 7. And so 
ultimately it's a 490 year period, um, 10 jubilees, and at the end of that we see uh, a lot of messianic hope, a lot of messianic activity, and obviously Yeshua, uh, you know, comes during that period along with John the Baptist. Um, but again, there's always a there's always a sign of hope. So even in Levit Leviticus, it says, "Yet in spite of all that, I will not reject them when they are in the lands of their enemies, nor will I loathe them to the point." Of utter, utterly destroying them and thus break my covenant with them. So again, God does not change his mind. He's loyal regardless of what Israel does. Uh, he is going to keep his promises. Um, and then once again, uh, Jeremiah 25 says, "In uh, This entire land will become a ruin, a waste, and these nations will serve the king of Babel for 70 years. So again, we're right on the cusp of that exile as we read through um, Jeremiah here. And so let's get going. In uh, Jeremiah 19, we'll start. It says, Adonai, my strength, my fortress, my refuge in time of trouble. The nations will come to you from the ends of the earth saying, Our ancestors inherited nothing but lies, futile idols, completely useless. Can a person make himself gods? In fact, they aren't gods at all. Therefore, I will make them know once and for all, I will make them know my power and my might. Then they will know that my name is Adonai. Yehuda's sins is written with an iron pen. With a diamond point it is engraved on the tablet of their hearts and on their horns of, their, of your altars. As they remember their children, so they remember their altars, and their sacred poles by the green trees and the high hills. My mountain in the field, your wealth, and all your treasures will be plundered because of the sin of your high places throughout your territory. You will relinquish your hold on your heritage which I gave you. I will make you serve your enemies in a land you do not know, for you have kindled my fiery anger, and it will burn forever. Uh, so we'll take a pause there and just uh, sort of discuss this. When he says, on your heritage which I gave you, right? So he's referring to the land of Israel. I will make you serve your enemies in a land that you do not know. So again, we go back to even the Garden of Eden, which, you know, the, the, the form of death in the Garden of Eden, Eden was exile, right? So God breathed life into Adam and put him in the garden, gave him a partner, and then said, here's the tree of life. Um, and the only thing that you, the only commandment at that point was not to eat from the tree of knowledge and good and evil. But you have to ask yourself, why was there a tree of life if God breathed life into Adam? Well, this seems to represent eternal life. Because as soon as Adam and Eve sinned, they were exiled from the garden, representing a certain type of death. They didn't actually die at that moment, but they were cut off from the tree of life. They were cut off from the garden. Uh, and Ever since then, we've been uh, just dealing with this sort of exile. Uh, we, see, we see that here as Israel's about to be exiled to Babylon. And it also reminds us that, you know, Yeshua comes and there's this sort of message that he's looking for the lost sheep of Israel. And so, you know, he's fulfilling these promises that God spoke about. Um, he is trying to gather the nations back to Israel. Uh, and we see that as an ongoing thing. And it's certainly one of the messianic promises uh, of what God is going to do. So we'll continue on now um, in Isaiah. A curse on the person who trusts in humans, who relies on merely human strength, whose heart turns away from Adonai. 
So this is a very sort of a literal thing, right? We're talking about the curses. And then Jeremiah goes on in verse 6 to give us some uh, poetic, you know, metaphors here. He will be like a tamarisk in the Arabah, like a tree in the desert. When relief comes, it is unaffected, for it lives in the sun-baked desert in salty, uninhabited land. Right? This is the cursed man. And he goes on to speak more literally about the blessed man. Blessed is the man who trusts in Adonai. Adonai will be his security. And then we get another poetic metaphor. In verse 8. He will be like a tree planted near water. It spreads out its roots by the river. It does not notice when heat comes. And its foliage is luxuriant. It is not anxious in a year of drought, but keeps on yielding fruit. So here's where we really tie into the uh, Torah portion in terms of cursings and blessings, right? We can do what is right and be blessed, or we can choose our own way and ultimately end up cursed. <clears throat> it's kind of interesting because when I read this, this is just one of the, the many questions I always ask myself or wrestle with, but, and I think theologians have wrestled with this since the time of these prophets, but uh, what does it actually mean to trust God, right? That's a, that's a pretty deep question. Um, it's certainly one that I think about often. <clears throat> so then we uh, pick up in verse 9, it says, The heart is more deceitful than anything else and mortally sick. Who can fathom it? I, Adonai, search the heart. I trust inner I test inner motivations in order to give to everyone what his actions and conducts uh, deserve. So here we get into, uh, you know, this reminds me of uh, Matthew 16. Uh, For the Son of Man will come in his Father's glory with his angels, and then he will repay everyone according to his conduct. And so we see this message throughout the gospel as well, right? We're reading here from Matthew. Um, but we see the same message in the prophets, and we see this obviously in the Torah portion as well, because again, your conduct is what will ultimately determine whether you are blessed or cursed. Then we go on in uh, verse 11 of Jeremiah 17. A partridge hashes eggs it did not lay. Like this are those who get rich unjustly. In the prime of life their wealth will desert them. And in the end they will prove to be fools. So in this poetic uh, sort of passage from Jeremiah, uh, essentially, you know, the partridge... Uh, took what it didn't deserve, uh, it enriched itself uh, through someone else's labor. And that's the analogy that we get here. Um, when we go by man's strength or our own strength, uh, it's, it's similar to us enriching ourselves uh, through someone else's labor, not recognizing that God is essentially in control of everything and everything we have, uh, he has given to us. So picking up in uh, verse 12, throne of glory, exalted from the beginning, our holy sanctuary, hope of Israel, Adonai, all who abandon you will be ashamed. Those who leave you will be inscribed in the dust because they have abandoned Adonai, the source of living water. Verse 14 says, heal me, Adonai, and I will be healed. Save me and I will be saved, for you are my praise. So this is an interesting passage because um, this is part of the Amidah, right? So as the rabbi was saying, there's basically 19 benedictions, 19 uh, uh, prayers within the uh, Amidah. We do two of them during our uh, Torah portions uh, here on Shabbat. We, this, the one that we do, uh, I think we do one and two. Uh, Mighty Deeds, or Gibor Adonai, uh, as part of the Amidah, and then, obviously, the Avot Fathers. 
this is actually, this passage is literally uh, the Amidah blessing number eight. Uh, it's called the Refua, the healing. Uh, and that reads, it's been changed just a little bit because here it's uh, in the singular, but in the Amidah, uh, it's directed toward Israel. So it says, Heal us, O Lord, we, and we will be healed. Help us, and we will be saved, for you are our praise. Uh, so that's where that comes from. It comes right out of Jeremiah right here. <clears throat> and that is the end of the, uh, that's where the, this portion ends. And so some of the gospel connections, we talked about uh, a few of those already. But um, these ones are pretty straightforward. I, you know, I don't understand, honestly, because I didn't grow up in, in the church, but I don't understand how the message has gotten so, so lost, in my, in my opinion. I just, I hear a lot of things that I just, it's hard for me to sort of reconcile. But I'm just going to read a little bit of Jesus' own words in the gospel. And I'm going to read from John here, 14 and something from 15. But it says, Whoever has my commands and keeps them is the one who loves me, and the one who loves me will be loved by my Father, and I will love him and reveal myself to him. Uh, it's hard to misinterpret that, what that means. Um, if Yeshua is the Word, and so he represents the Torah, I think that's very straightforward uh, of how we're supposed to live and what our faith should look like. He goes on to say in Je John chapter 15, verse 9, Just as my Father has loved me, I too have loved you. So stay in my love. If you keep my commandments, you will stay in my love, just as I have kept my Father's commandments and stayed in his love. Again, that's a, that's a pretty uh, straightforward statement. Um, there's a lot of debate over what it means to follow Yeshua, and what it means to have faith. Um, but when I read these things, it just seems pretty clear, right? I mean, we're supposed to, in the same way as Israel, I mean, if we really do love the Messiah, then, you know, we should follow God's commands. Um, it's kind of interesting because... Yeshua comes and gives his interpretation uh, on the laws and the regulations because they were being misinterpreted uh, quite often. But he says in a very, uh, you know, Second Temple rabbinic way, uh, you have heard it said that you are to love your neighbor um, and hate your enemy. But I tell you that you should also love your enemy. And the way that I read that, or the way that I interpret that, is it's really easy to love someone who loves you back, right? I mean, that's just an easy thing to do. You don't really have to try much. And what, what he's teaching us here is that it takes a lot more to love someone who doesn't love you back. And in that same style of teaching... Um, and I run into this a lot. It's easy to keep certain commandments. It's easy to say, well, yeah, okay, we shouldn't, we shouldn't uh, murder, and we shouldn't lie, and we shouldn't commit adultery. Those things uh, resonate with our own reasoning, right? Those things are obvious to us, to any human being, right? It's obvious, whether or not they, they actually abide by that, but it's certainly obvious. When you get into some of the other commandments that we don't understand and we have no reason, uh, no, no way to reason about it, um, kosher laws and just all these things that we just can't rationalize in our own minds, that's when, that's when your true faith really comes out, right? It doesn't take much faith to not want to murder somebody or not commit adultery. It really doesn't take much faith. It takes a whole lot of faith to do some of these other things that just make no sense to us. Why, why is it, why is it, 
unholy to eat unclean animals, you know, to have pork. I have no idea. I mean, I've heard all kinds of ways of trying to rationalize these things, like, well, you know, maybe it was a health reason or whatever, but it takes a lot of faith to be able to follow those commandments and because we have no idea. We're kind of in the dark about what it actually means, but the whole faith part of it is it doesn't really matter what it means. It's just we were told not to do it, right? And so it really does remind me of, of you know, Yeshua's teachings and uh, this idea of fencing around some of these laws. We don't understand God's ways. We can try, and we should try. Some of them we can make sense out of. Other things we can't. Um, they weren't allowed in the temple. Uh, unclean animals. And, and so maybe it's... Maybe we don't have as many prophets today as because we keep our own temple unclean, right? Maybe that's, maybe that's why we're not supposed to eat some of those things. Because it doesn't allow God's, God's spirit to, uh, to really dwell in us the way that it should or the way that it could, right? So we don't, we don't have a whole lot of prophets today. You have to ask yourself why that is. but uh, So... Just uh, a final thought is that, you know, thoughts and prayers aren't necessarily enough when bad things happen. Uh, it requires us to act. And so I think uh, faith is, is also about action, right? They said even the demons believe, right? So it really is about, about how we act. And if we look at what Israel is going through here, uh, it's easy to point fingers and say, man, they just didn't get it, and uh, they, were, they were sinful, but, you know, I guess we should all <laughs> maybe take that log out of our own eye and look in the mirror and see how we're living. Because uh, maybe, you know, obviously Israel didn't see it at the time. They thought their prophets were crazy. and So we're probably just as blind nowadays. But that's my final thoughts, and uh, that wraps up. Off Torah reading. Very good. Very good. Perfect. Perfect. Thank you, Eric. I like how God weaves everything together. All I can say is I have my message to give. You don't know what it is. I didn't know what his was, but I know what mine is. And all I can say is that God has a really interesting way of weaving things together. And in a little bit, I'm going to show you what that is. <laughs> so, um, thank you, Eric. Bless you. Good, good word on the Haftorah. Thank you. It was I who made you, formed you.